Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our fourth Pulp Literature Live reading series. Today, I am joined by A.J. Odasso, Ashley Elizabeth Best, and Ingrid Yenjevsky. I hope I said that right. Uh, give everybody Thank a wave. <laughs> uh, so we're going to have three readings this morning. Um, uh, and um, first up, we've got A.J. Odasso, so I'm just going to uh, switch over the screens here. My computer's being a little bit laggy too, just as we go live, of course. And there we go. So, uh, A.J.'s story uh, appeared in two issues of pulp literature, uh, issue 17 and issue 18. We split it into two um, because it was it was long, but it, it broke very nicely in the middle because the first half of the story um, was in letters and the second half was a sort of regular narrative. Uh, but we just, we fell in love with the story and we absolutely needed to have it and we were delighted that we could publish it across two issues. And a um, little bit about AJ, uh, their poetry, essays, and short fiction have been published in a variety of magazines since 2005. Uh, they have a collection of poetry out uh, in the last six or so, which was uh, The Sting of It. Oh, there it is. Uh, and it won the best LGBTQ book in the New Mexico Arizona Book Awards and AJ has been serving as senior poetry editor at Strange Horizon magazines since 2012. So AJ, I will turn the mic over to you. This um, short story, I don't write short fiction um, all that often, relatively speaking. I write predominantly poetry and creative nonfiction essays. Um, when I was living in the UK near the end of my time there in 2011, I think it was 2010, 2011, there was um, that stage production at South Bank Center of Frankenstein where um, Johnny Lee Miller and Benedict Cumberbatch were switching the roles night by night. Um, it was a very faithful adaptation. I saw it a couple of times, um, both um, permutations of the casting and someone who was with me on the second night of seeing the show said to me, me, you know, this novel, and as much as you loved this play, um, oh, you should do um, a steampunk lesbian retelling of Frankenstein. And it was said half jokingly, but I said, you know what, I'm going to take you up on that. And so um, this story, We Come Back Different, is what came of it. So this is the second letter in the first half of the story. 12th of June, 1800, and St. Andrews, Scotland. Sweet Amelia, this correspondence may reach your shores by sea rather than by air, much to my annoyance. The pilot strike cannot continue indefinitely, so why not apply your political acumen to that next, when next you submit a column to the Transatlantic Weekly? Several of the faculty here are ardent followers of your rambling yet sagacious way. Perhaps it will earn you a scholarship. Please do not think that I have not taken to heart the contents of your letter, but I must report a strange occurrence that has lately beset my corner of the world. Lansdowne, my tutor, has been ardently in favor of my chosen discipline, that is, the repair and replacement of organs and other such vital tissue through methods of hermetically sealed replacements, etc. I will not attempt another description of these devices' components, nor of the fusion by which they run in perpetuity. You, lively and insightful, must populate this world with wonders, whereas I, eternally brooding, must endeavor to unlock the causes of unhappiest misfortunes and to repair them, if I am able. The occurrence of which I speak centers on one misfortune, Amelia, the gravest of them all, I fear, to which none of us are immune. The body of a young woman washed on the west stand over a week ago. My employment as liaison between the university laboratories and the local mor mortuary ensured my presence on the scene. I had the unfortunate task of interviewing the elderly gentleman who discovered the poor girl. He had hardly 
imagined his morning stroll would be thus ruined, and he could hardly bring himself to look upon me, I think, because he could easily imagine me in place of the corpse. I felt sorry for him. It would have amazed you to see her, pale skin faintly blue beneath a wash of sand and seawater, so different from you, my Indian beauty, and from myself, wild-haired and brown-skinned with no hope of sorting out whence it all has emerged from my ancestors' trysts. She faced the sky, gray eyes wide, scarcely three hours dead, or so my reckoning would have it. You were the poet, yet I could not help but fancy the dark ribbons of her hair resembled, resembled endless, rippled strands of kelp. I closed her eyes and rolled her onto her side, folded up her limbs like those of a sleeping child. We have employed the time since, making ceaseless inquiries as to her origins. There have been no reports of missing persons matching her appearance, much, le must, much less her age and sex. We have taken great pains to preserve her with minimal intervention. This has long been a prized accomplishment of our institution. If this bare soul should remain unknown, I have pressed upon Lansdowne to ensure that she might remain with us as a subject. My research has thus far concerned the workings of disparate parts, but I am eager that I should begin to apply my findings, as it were, to the whole. A specimen so well preserved would be of great advantage. I had not intended for this letter to dwell on matters you find macabre, my love, but at present this endeavor is the heart of my existence. I tire of precision cut gears and steam burns to my fingertips as the only fruits of my labors. I must discover whether these devices work. Fondly, Tess. That is wonderful. I love actually hearing this from the author's voice. It's just, it's such a treat for me when, when we don't get to see our authors in person, we finally get to hear the stories read out by them. And I find that that, that letter is such a great, um, example of store of wonderful storytelling because you have given us so much information about this couple a relationship um, in the first two letters that you give us and and we skip to the second letter um, because it introduces the third character or the character in the story um, which is at the moment a corpse but uh, um, so tell me how when you when you created Characters. Who came first, Amelia or Tess? Um, I think Tess did. I was thinking about my Victor figure as a starting point. Um, this, I guess, triangle of protagonists that I that I have, um, Tess and Amelia and um, Halcyon, who decides to call herself Alice. Um, the name gets. Um, goes through a, a kind of evolution. I should also note that this is said, um, well, obviously um, in an alternate 1800s, and I've undertaken that device where um, the exact decade of the 1800s is always, um, you know, that the M dash to, yeah. to blank it out. Um, it's set in, in an alternate history where, um, so Amelia is back at home in Bermuda, an independent Bermuda, and um, Tess is studying um, in St. Andrews, Scotland. Um, so my, my protagonist came about um, Tess, Halcyon, Flesh, Alice, and then Amelia. And um, once I had those three, it was really not that difficult for me to start writing the letters. Um, I knew who they were and how they were going to function as derivatives of um, uh, Shelley's, Shelley's storytelling. And um, I thought, well, I've always liked epistolary. Um, there's a great deal of Frankenstein that, that is epistolary itself, albeit near the end. So I thought, I'm going to flip the script and have the first half of this story be told in letters. And then switch um, the more, well, the letters I would like to think are vivid and immediate. But to me, uh, the second half of the story actually um, I switch from letters, and then at the beginning of the second half of the story, we get some of Tessa's laboratory log, um, her notebooks, 
while she's working working on the project. And then it switches to more real time, um, third person limited narrative. That yeah. was sort of a rambling um, <laughs> answer to that. No, no, I love it. And I love I, I because you brought up other things that I was going to ask anyway, so that's perfect. Um, and I do love the way the different means of telling a story each give a different lens on the story, which is a wonderful way of looking at this this triad from all sorts of different points of view. Um, so stay around um, so in case we have more questions at the end. And thank you, and I am going to bring Ashley Elizabeth Best on to screen now. Hi Ashley Elizabeth. Hi. Welcome. Um, so Ashley Elizabeth Best, uh, we published her in a uh, way back in the winter of uh, 2016, uh, her poem Wintering. Um, and there's, you know, not much I can say about it. A, a poem is pretty much going to speak for itself. Uh, but I can say a little bit about Ashley Elizabeth. So she's from Kingston, Ontario. Uh, she's had work published in CV2, Ambit Magazine, Literary Review of, Can of Canada, Columbia Review, and Glasgow Review of Books, among others. Uh, and she was a finalist for the Robert Pretch Award for Innovative Poetry. And her debut collection of poetry, Slow States of Collapse, was published with ECW Press. Um, and what year was that? Can I have? Oh, there it is. Uh, 2016, actually, yeah. Oh, okay, <laughs> so, great. And wintering is in, in this book, so. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah, my grandparents live uh, north of Bancroft here in Ontario, which is pretty close to Algonquin Park. And um, I was just thinking about what uh, drew my ancestors to uh, that piece of Ontario and what keeps bringing me back. Um, my grandfather is a hunting uh, cabin up there, so I was just uh, thinking back to my youth and when I spent time there. Wintering. How these days make a spiraled collapse into clump or of snowbanks. At our cabin on the edge of Algonquin Park, wolves roam under the skeletal canopy, dark under the winter sun, excessive light. In the luminary tide, we are the lusters of hard beauty. Startled by the evening grosbeak, landing in the hearts of giant coniferous carcasses, triggering rippled waves of snow. The winter sun enlarges life's dark comedy, the overwhelming presence of tree spines, their whole being ba laid bare beside full-skirted black spruce. The wood inhabitants, strung out and hungry, wander watchful as the light descends above spiked bodies. Um. And I have another poem here uh, to read. Um, it's a newer one. Uh, it's called Alignment. My body smells animal under my coat. Hello, fire. I offer you letters from my past. Pictures of those lost. See my body bulked up to your hot flank. No sirens tonight here in the countryside, but this standstill will not last. Fire soothe my sore sockets. I'll follow the wraith-faced owl belly down in snow, knees wet and swollen, voice braided into the wind. I'm meant for open air. A loose tooth chips its silted points into the flesh of my gums. In every direction, a person of consequence stands before shedding pines, the winter sun prying their shapes into a darkened distance. I'm a city of iron wine where no starlight is visible at 2 a.m., where the light sleds off in greeting to the moon. He won't speak to me, and what can I do out here in slummy kilometers of smoke and hills, knuckled with the shield's toned musculature, rocks shedding off their joints? I don't ask. It doesn't mean I don't deserve to be told. I adore his pitiable tone, so practical. He just wants an opportunity to refuse. The shadows crease with shades of firelight. His feelings bruise on mine as hills of clouds sprain their bulk anew to the wind's sleight of hand. January has come to winter in my bones, swollen knees in the cold rush, and my frozen parchment skin clasped to a glass, a benediction of drink, the night's fist of gin. I've ransomed my life, a bear downing a deer, wishing for him in the noisy hold of the city. 
Before sunrise tomorrow, five planets will align, just before a quickening of light, such a brief time to be visible. I'll raise my eyes to its passing. All this nature infects me. I jackknife my body, feel for the pulp of leaves under snow, the day's warmth siphoned off, the snow approaching the tree-lined ocean with trap. That was wonderful, Ashley Elizabeth. Thank you so much. That is, I have to say that poem and wintering are just so quintessentially Canadian. I, I mean, you just, it feels Canadian right down to the bones. Um, <laughs> can you, <I'm> glad. <laughs> no, it, it, it sort of, it puts me in mind of like, you know, um, Margaret Atwood's Wilderness Tales or Farley Mowat or, you know, that, that it sort of brings back all those, um, sort of, you know, great Canadian literary works of, of the wilderness and the landscape. And, and um, so what are some of your inspirations when you're writing poetry? Um, I guess it's a lot of autobiographical um, uh, ideas, I guess. Um, I'm inspired a lot by my grandparents and near Bancroft and uh, nature. I, no matter how hard I try, I end up writing about the landscapes around me. I just can't stop. <laughs> well, don't stop because, <laughs> because it's wonderful. Um, and uh, what are you working on now? Um, I'm working on uh, my second manuscript. Um, it's tentatively titer, titled uh, Forgetting My Future Self. Um, it's about halfway done, so I'm pretty excited about that. Um, alignment will be in it, actually. So. Oh, great, great. Yeah. Um, and will it be coming out from the same press, or? Uh, I think so. Uh, once it's done, I send it to them. I'll see what they say. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> the uh, CW Press, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, yeah, be sure to to send me those links, and I will you know put the chat, uh, put it up in the chat after. Uh, after the video is recorded so that people can go and buy buy your books um, and let me just uh, I had one oh I thought I had a, another question here but I can't see it anymore um, I, I do have I have another question for you um, and so tell me about um, Aside from your inspiration, how do you go about writing the poetry? Like, what? How do you choose your structures? How do you, or does it just sort of come to you, or or do you sit down with a with a structure in mind when you have a when you have something you want to say? Um, I think I try to think of structure and form as little as possible. It's um, it's like a cognitive dissonance thing. I I actively try to turn off um my front consciousness and just uh, I end up piecing together bits from my notebook. Um, I often have like a documentary going, I'll be reading two books at the same time and I'll just, it's whatever comes out of the amalgamation of things in front of me. Um, it often draws out what I'm already thinking about or concerned with. Um, I have a hard time recognizing my own ones, um, in the moment. So um, my poetry often helps me draw out how I'm feeling. I just I just lost audio for a minute, but I hope the recording got that answer. Uh, so, oh. <laughs> uh, I just I just lost the last few seconds. Uh, te technology is wonderful, isn't it? Um, oh, but okay. it's wonderful yeah. that we can do this at all. So we, I sh I shouldn't complain about. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think it was on my computer. So hear me now. I can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, okay. It just glitched okay. for a bit. Uh, so stay around. Um, for the end of the show, and I am going to bring Ingrid on. And it seems to be paused. There we go. Okay. Hi, Ingrid. Hello, hello. So, uh, 
Ingrid Janjewski is uh, co-director co of the National Flash Fiction Day, editor-in-chief of Flashback Fiction and a Flash editor at JMWW. Uh, she has soft spots for Go, Cryptic Crosswords, and the Python pro programming language. And uh, she was also the winner of the 2017 Bumblebee Flash Fiction Prize. Uh, so that is what we published in the summer issue in 2017, uh, issue 15. And uh, that's what she's going to read for us today. Welcome, Ingrid. Lovely. Thank oh, well, thank you so much for running all of this. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm going to read my piece, Crush Velvet which um, is a, a big tone shift from what has come before. Um, I just finished writing a bunch of very serious um, pieces and prose poetry and these sorts of things. And uh, when I wrote this, I was sitting down to just absolutely relax and have some good fun um, and, and just uh, be a, let myself be a bit ridiculous. So this is called Crushed Velvet. When I get home, my skinny clothes are dancing. They are making a terrific racket. What do you think you're doing? I ask. And the answer comes back all chiffon bubbly from my first prom dress. Celebrating. Celebrating our freedom, adds a snarky velvet bustier from my goth phase. I let its impudent tone slide by unchecked. I don't like mess, but they all look so happy I decide to join in. What to a jaunty jive, I am for a moment transported. It's been a long time since I've let loose. But before long, I come to the uncomfortable realization that I am the only one still dancing. My work clothes are clinging to my body, startled and suspicious. I stop dead in my two step. Yes, well, ruffles the brazier in which I lost my virginity. We'll be off now. We were just waiting until you got home so that we could say goodbye. My cheeks flush, so I brush my hands briskly over my pantsuit to eliminate creases. What are you talking about? Oh, come on, I bet the matching lace knickers. It's no fun being cooped up in drawers and closets for years on end. Even you go out once in a while. To work, I retort, instantly realizing that I'm not helping my cause. Yes, sneers the Liza Minnelli bowler hat as it bobs knowingly at the rock horror hot pants. The crop top is more forgiving. Really though, it says gently, you're not going to wear us again, are you now? I control top pantyhose snigger around my waist, tickling my stretch marks. I snap the waistband. I could. I might. Oh, sweetheart, sigh the fishnets, and all of us settle into a long silence. My eyes sting and the corners of my mouth tremble. But, like any good general, I rally. I scan the room, survey my resources, size up my army. It is time, I decide, to my weight. Ladies, I cry, and my current wardrobe, the clothing I've trained up with a harsh regimen of ironing and starch, unfold to attention. I look them over and nod. They aren't pretty, but they can get the job done. Get them. Before my skinny clothes know what's happening, my active duty wardrobe is upon them. It is utter carnage, a veritable massacre of colors and flounce. Moo-moos smother slim fit jeans, elasticated waistbands strangle string bikinis, ponchos pull no punches. There's one last desperate rush of sequins as a clutch of evening dresses makes a break for the door, but they are cut off by a phalanx of girdles and reinforced bras. Within minutes, the uprising is crushed like velvet. When it is over, I stand triumphant amidst the boning and tulle. My work clothes celebrate the green bras with pride. Together, we string the skinny clothes hangers crucify them with clothes pegs. When they've all been put back in place, I shut the closet doors and smile. The crop top was right. I'm never going to wear those things again. But old clothes hold on to memories forever and know too many secrets. No way am I going to let them give me the slip, not at least while my overall satisfaction with life, work, myself still hangs 
by a thread. Oh, that is delightful to hear that read out loud. <laughs> it was so fun to write, so ridiculous. Uh, it was it was so fun to read. And, and when we're doing the first reading for these contests, we're not the final judge, Bob Thurber is the final judge, but you know, we, we come up with the best 10 stories that we can find. And, and I tell you, we were all rooting for that one when it, um, oh. when we sent it through to Bob, it's just, I mean, the, the metaphors in there are, are just wonderful. And I think, um, uh, you know, all of us who've, you know, gone on to have children or just change shape in general have, can all relate to it. Uh, so um, what are you working on now? Oh, I'm writing a lot of flash fiction still, um, although I'm now trying to piece them together into longer works. So I have some that are sort of based on uh, family history, uh, particularly the um, Polish family um, that's loosely based on family stories but have gone in a very strange sort of magical realism direction. And then I've got another that's sort of loosely based on um, uh, uh, the Aeneid and uh, myths but taking out the women characters and telling their stories and trying to fill in some of the gaps. But uh, those, those, they'll be a while before those see the light of day. All right. And because you're a flash fiction editor, as well as a flash fiction contest winner, do you have any advice for people who are entering contests? We have a contest starting up March 1st, The Hummingbird. So um, what would you, what, what's your best advice to, to writers who want to uh, deliver those, those heavy punches with short, short work? Uh, well, I think sh short, short work, so much of it is about really honing the story. I often overwrite and then um, cut back quite uh, rigorously. I often cut out the beginning or cut out the end. It takes a while sometimes to write into a story. I'd really recommend writing it as early as you can so that you have plenty of time to revisit it after a week or two weeks or a month um, because I, you can almost always find things to cut out. Uh, many, many times as an editor, I've asked people to, you know, if, uh, you know, we've worked at cutting back a story. Um, very rarely have we wanted to add very much. So I think, I think uh, one, one lovely thing about Flash is the gaps you can leave between um, moments and words, letting the reader fill those, those moments in. Right, yes, that, I think that's, that's very good advice. Um, and, and it's good advice for fiction in general, I think, not just flash fiction. Even novels can use that, that intense pairing, although it's a lot more work to pair a novel than to pair, you know, a thousand word story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm going to bring our other guests back on again. Um, because, AJ, I didn't get a chance to ask you what you're working on now. Um, so I went to AWP in San Antonio at the beginning of March. It was um, the last time I traveled before all of the sh shelter in place um, started. Um, ironically, I was feeling a bit better that weekend than I am now. I've been um, recovering from, um, I, I was diagnosed with colon cancer in October last year and I had fairly major surgery at the end of November. So I was on um, medical leave for about three months. I got back to my job for about, I think, three or four weeks, went to AWP, and then this started quickly. So it's given me time to think about my next project, which was um, tripped off by my editor at Tolson Books. Um, it was my first time meeting the Tolson crew in person at AWP. And um, we were talking about, well, you know, someone made the wisecrack, looks like there's an impending apocalypse. And it made me think of this joke that I've been making for years and almost all of my friends know it. And so I said, you know, I feel like a bad person when I confess to this, but in my head, I have um, what I call my apocalypse loot list, um, artifacts <laughs> in different museums in different cities that if I happen to be in those one of those cities when the zombie apocalypse came, I know what one or two artifacts I would grab from each major museum I've ever visited. And my editor's eyes just got wider and wider and wider as I um, fessed up to this. 
And he said, can that be your next collection? I would love to publish it. And I said, you're on. So um, I have one poem, which I, I think will probably function like the, um, the prologue, the, the first poem in the book. And what I've been doing is working on the list to make sure that I don't miss out any of the artifacts. I'm trying to remember all the museums I've been to. There's about a dozen that come to mind right away. Um, but I know there are some smaller ones that probably I've forgotten about over the years. So that's what I'm working on right now. That is so cool. That is an awesome idea for a collection. <laughs> I love it. And it's and it, it's an awesome idea just to have an apocalypse list of, of all the things you'd save. <laughs> or go I don't think it makes you a terrible person. <laughs> More like steal more like steal them for my for my own enjoyment than, you know like I don't have the, the right preservation tools but um, I don't know I'm a bit of a, I, I have a, I have an art collection um, that is mostly originals by people that I know um, only a small number of them are um, not are by people I don't know um, so um, if ever I have um, a lot of money <laughs> you know what I will be doing with it with a good deal of it. Well, that's a good question. Um, so if you could have one piece of art right now just given to you, what, what any piece of art in the world, what would it be? Um, at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, which is where I lived for about a decade of my life, actually. I live in New Mexico now. I moved here three years ago from Boston. Um, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. There's this little triangle that used to be at the top of, a, of an Italian altarpiece from the High Middle Ages. Um, it's a depiction of Saint Elizabeth of Hungary. Um, and it is the size that you could put in like the average Jansport backpack to give you an idea of scale and why I started thinking about my list in the first place. <laughs> but the colors in the paint, they're rolling up. Um, in her cloak, the you know the, the the gold leaf, the color of her hair, the expression on her face. It's one of the most vivid uh, pieces of artwork from from that particular um, era and part of the world uh, that I've ever seen. And it's I if I could have one right now, that would she Saint Elizabeth of Hungary in the Isabella Stewart Gardner. I am going to look that up. Um, Ashley Elizabeth, is, if there was a piece of art that you could have, any piece in the world, what would you what would you have? Hmm. Probably wouldn't be a piece of art. It'd probably be a fossil. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, I love uh, um, history museums and uh, fossils, and probably like a T Rex skull or something. Oh like yeah. <laughs> Not very practical for sneaking out of a museum, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a hard one to put in a backpack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and what about you, Ingrid? Oh, it's it's very difficult. Both my parents are artists. My dad's a, a sculptor and my mom is a, a painter. And I remember when I was growing up, um, they had access to a big uh, studio space at the university where they taught. And both of them made these just enormous pieces of art that, you know, couldn't really easily be stored in a home. And, and they just the smell of those spaces and the, the, the kind of feeling of being in those studios is are so nostalgic for me. So if I had to pick one, it would probably be one of my dad's huge driftwood sculptures. I mean, they were, they were quite, they were room sized. Um, and of course they all had to be destroyed once, you know, it, it, there was no space to store them. But I have such fond memories of growing up in that space. I'd want those, some of those pieces back or my mom's big canvases from grad school. Um, they're not very house appropriate, but, but I do love them. Oh, wow, you come from an extremely artistic family. <laughs> It runs in the blood. <laughs> well, we're out of time. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us and, and lightening our Friday morning and during these trying times. And uh, this will be up uh, in uh, the recorded version later on today. And uh, I wish you all well over the next weeks and uh, hang on in there. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thanks, all of you. Yeah. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.